We're going to talk about three main things in this episode that are easily misdiagnosed, and when they are diagnosed, typical treatment options aren't very promising. I am quite sure that everyone listening knows someone affected by one of these diagnoses, and I'm hoping that you will listen with that person in mind and share this episode with them. Because there is indeed hope for Lyme disease, autism spectrum disorder, and PANS pandas. Dr. Lindsay Wells is a naturopathic doctor from Connecticut that actually specializes in treating patients that have these struggles and has seen amazing positive outcomes in her patients. Our son was diagnosed with Lyme disease at 12 years old, and we fought for his healing, so I know the value of what Dr. Wells is doing and the hope that is truly possible. I can't wait for you to hear her stories. Today's review shout out is for S. Roberts 21, who says, I love listening. There is so much good information about how to live healthier as a family. Thanks so much for this. We really appreciate y'all sharing the podcast with friends and leaving five-star reviews on Spotify and Apple to help us keep growing. Welcome to the Daily Wellness Podcast, where you can learn about healthy living and be inspired to take the next step in your wellness journey. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited for you guys to meet Dr. Wells, and we can all get to know her today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm, I mean, you're in Connecticut, and I'm in Missouri. So I I have these dreamy like ideals of those states in the Northeast. So I think it's just must be wonderful living there. It is pretty nice. I love the four seasons. And um, you, you have, in Connecticut, we can easily get to Boston. We can easily get to New York. We can easily get to the beach. So it's a nice space to be. Yeah, true. And you have some mountains up there. I mean, oh, yeah. All the things. Yeah. I've seen pictures of you hiking and enjoying all the outdoorsy things. Absolutely. We love hiking. We love going to national parks. So we like to travel all over to go to the mountains in particular. So, yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, you're a naturopathic doctor. So, what is the journey that kind of led you there? Sure. So, um, I am a naturopathic doctor. I am also a mom of a two-year-old son, and I also have a rescue dog that comes with me to work, to work with the children. Um, so what led me to naturopathic medicine? You know, I really don't have that. Well, I don't think it's that interesting <laughs> of a story, but essentially I thought I wanted to go to the traditional medical route. And I was spending a lot of time in high school and college working in different medical offices. And when I was in college, I was working in particular at a urologist office because I was like, oh, I want to be a urologist. There's not many female urology urologists. And, you know, it is an important area that women need care in. Um, and I was going in on different visits and one in particular really stood out to me. And it was a, a man who came in with his sister and he had bladder cancer. So before we went into the the off like the appointment the urologist that I was working with showed me the scans and showed me the bladder cancer but what I was really interested what was really interesting about the experience was that when we went into the appointment the doctor didn't bring up the bladder cancer at all and so after that appointment I said to her why didn't you mention the bladder cancer or talk about it and she just said that's not my job that's the job of an oncologist and it really struck me because this in particular, these were lovely people. It was clear and they communicated that they were all that each other had in regards to family. And I just really left that experience being like, I don't want to practice like this. I don't want to be this. Like if I want to work with somebody, I want to treat them as a like whole. I want I want to be able to spend more with them. I want to know what's going on um, with them and not just like stay in one little category. And it really just left me, um, it really left me a lot to reflect on. So I ended up quitting that job pretty soon after because I'm like, I'm not going to do this. And then in growing up, my dad um, probably for, uh, it, it was a good quality, but he, he didn't, he always said like, don't come home unless you have a job. So when I quit, I had to find a job very quickly. And so I ended up going to a local vitamin store. And um, that's where I learned about naturopathic medicine. And it was with someone who 
wasn't a licensed ND, meaning they didn't go to a four-year accredited like doctoral program. But uh, regardless, it, it allowed me to f- figure out or explore what naturopathic medicine was. And it was actually my husband at the time we were just dating. He looked into it and he's like, wow, Lindsay, this sounds like you, what you would really like to do. And so we looked up, there was a school in Connecticut, the University of Bridgeport. I could drive there and I didn't have to fly to interview. So I set up an interview and that's that. Then I ended up uh, going through naturopathic medical school. So, wow. Now, I think that's very interesting. Like, and I think it's amazing. Like that took a lot of courage on your part. Number one, to quit that job where it just did not line up with your values. And then two, to go like kind of a non-traditional route. Yes. I don't think I knew what I was getting myself into. (laughs) (laughs) And now, like in your practice, do you work with a variety of ages or do you work with mostly kids? So my passion is in pediatrics and it's always been that way going through uh, school. I really wanted to work with pediatrics and I started my practice uh, doing more primary care pediatrics, but that really wasn't where my heart was. So I wanted to work with the special needs and chronic uh, illnesses in the pediatric uh, realm. But um, I have limited my practice to also working with the parents of the children. And because really, when you have a child with chronic illness and chronic disease, it's not just a pediatric illness, it really ends up being a whole family illness. And so I find and I'm, one thing I'm very passionate about is uh, the mother's health in particular, because I do feel like when the mother feels better, the child gets better without many interventions. So um, my practice is mainly pediatrics, but I do say it's a family practice because I will see the parents of the children I work with. I think that's so smart, like really smart of you, like mm-hmm. to really see past like just this one individual's experience to the family experience. Absolutely. It really takes a toll on the family dynamic and how that in- impacts the child as well and also the siblings. Um, so one of my little projects that I did on maternity leave actually was I wrote a little book about Pan's Pandas for uh, the siblings of who has like a brother or a sister with Pan's just to better explain because it really does impact the whole family. So it's important that everyone feels supported in the journey. Yeah, for sure. And my son was diagnosed with Lyme disease last year in 2022. Okay. So you understand. So yeah, so that makes a lot of sense to me. And so we'll talk about Lyme in a little bit and I can share more about that. But yes, you're absolutely right. Like it was a whole family journey to work on his healing for sure. Absolutely. So and it says, I read on your website that your practice really focuses on integrative care for pans and pandas, Lyme disease and Lyme co-infections and the autism spectrum disorder. Is that pretty much right? Yes, those are my three specialties. Yeah. So I, it might be ambitious of us, but I'd love to chat through all of those a little bit. Sure. Um, what was it in your experience and in your practice that kind of led you to focus in on these? So it was interesting doing my clinic rotations when I was focusing on pediatrics. There was in particular, like a young adult um, who came in with autism. And oh my gosh, he just lit up the world. Like everyone here was around, you just couldn't help but smile and love him. Like, and I was like, wow, if I could work with this population, my life would be pretty good. Like, and so it really led me down looking at that. And what I found, which was a little disturbing, is that with autism, there's not a lot of resources for adolescents or for the young adults. There's just a lot of focus on the younger children. And what I was seeing is that it didn't matter what age the child or the adult was. There was always opportunity for improvement and for growth. Um, and so it that's what kind of led me to the um, working with the children and young adults with autism. And then my practice, I ended up working in a space with my mentor who was also worked a lot with autism, but uh, pans pandas, and it just kind of found me. Um, and like I said, we'll go into pans pandas in a bit, but that one is really a illness that really impacts the whole family. And I think because I understand how the fi- family dynamics work and just the extent at how it can impact family, I was pretty... Uh, I was able to take to it pretty easily. And um, I think I have a unique perspective on treating pans pandas. So 
And then, of course, Lyme disease and co-infections. I live in Connecticut, so where Lyme was originally sounded. So it, it's, uh, it, it was inevitable. I'd have to be working with that if I uh, was working in the state, I feel like. That's true. Yeah. And we, I mean, I live in kind of a smaller area in Missouri. We're outside all the time. And I remember with Lyme, it was something that I heard of occasionally, maybe as a as a teen, young adult, but definitely has become more prevalent. Is that true? Like, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I every single year it goes up significantly on the cases, which are extremely underdiagnosed. Um, and Lyme disease is found in all 50 states, no question. And I always say that, you know, I'm more afraid of the ticks I don't find than the ticks I do find, right? And also with the testing, it's not sensitive enough. So there's a lot of false negatives. So there's a lot of underdiagnosis. But I personally feel that it's not Lyme disease in particular that's the biggest issue. It's actually the co-infections, um, in particular Bartonella, which again, um, I feel like is at the root of a lot of chronic disease for adults and for children. It's staggering how uh, common it is in my practice. So um, I, I agree. I think there, it's just understudied. Um, and I think when you actually look at the research, it's based on the traditional testing standards that they have, which are just not sufficient. And um, so that's but with that, as I said, yes, it's going up, but it's way higher than what we we think it is. Yeah. So can you explain that a little bit? Why is Lyme disease so serious and the co-infections that come with it? Yeah. So Lyme disease is serious because it's known as the great masquerader, right? So it's really the, the symptoms are very diverse. They're vast. And, you know, I think people do associate Lyme disease with a certain part of the country, right? Like the East Coast rather than different areas like Missouri. So I think it's not on the radar and it's not a high levels at, for like a, a DDX that people consider. It's also dangerous in the sense that it's often not caught, right? Unless somebody has like the classic bullseye rash, right? And even that, like less than I would say 20% of people will get that. And it doesn't always look like a classic bullseye rash anymore. It could just be any type of rash. It's really uh, interesting how it can present. And I also think this standard treatment is not sufficient in the sense that, you know, maybe you're lucky. I think the CDC now it's like one day of doxycycline when or if you're lucky and you really push, you get three weeks. It's not these bugs are so smart. They love their life in your bot in the person's body and it will change forms to hide. It will stay there. And you it's just not treated for long enough and it ends up becoming chronic Lyme disease, but then or tick-borne disease, or I should really say vector-borne disease, not tick-borne disease, because it can be transmitted through other vectors, not just ticks. Because of that, um, it, it just becomes a problem of it then later on when there's other stressors on the body, it can come out, but it can manifest in different ways and you get different diagnoses like mental health disorders, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so that's what the problem is. It's really at the root, but uh, it, you're getting the misdiagnosed. Yeah. And I diagnose it. Yeah. I was reading some research about MS and the doctor was like, almost all of my MS patients have Lyme like yeah. <laughs> as an underlying factor. So for sure, it can contribute to a lot of really serious issues. Um, Absolutely. An example of kind of to illustrate what you're saying with my son, he was just much more tired than a 12 year old should be. <laughs> you know, I was like, I have four children and I'm like, you are, why are you tired? Like I'm 40 years old and I don't need to lay down as much as you, you know? And he would complain of back pain and his feet hurt and his legs hurt. And I was just like, this is just not normal. And so I contacted our pediatrician um, just to get some feedback. And they, at that time, were doing like mostly nurse line type of conversations. And so they'll kind of like vet you through the nurse line and see if they want you to come in or not. And so gave them all the symptoms and everything. And they basically called me back and said, I don't think he needs to come in. I think it's just um, growing pains and you need to give him some ibuprofen. And I'm like my mom instinct was like, that's not what this is at all. Like I knew that that was not accurate. And so 
who actually sought out like a functional medicine doctor at that point that's been kind of walking us through the journey. But that's just an example of how it's missed a lot of times. Um, And then in the testing, I really learned as we tested him, like, wow, like the testing that is often done through a mainstream medical provider is not sufficient at all. Well, it was good you listened to your mom, Ika. And I always tell my moms, like, you know what's happening. You know what your child best and you have to listen. And man, the moms in my practice, they blow me away every single day. They're so persistent, so committed. They know what's going on and um, they get the help that they need for their children. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. And it has been like probably we've been at his treatment for a little over a year. So it does take a long time to to work at it. So it's just <laughs> So, you know, if anyone is thinking that they climb, like be prepared. (laughs) One thing about the testing, I usually tell people like it's a minimum of two years. Like things definitely get better, but anticipate two years of treatment for any vector borne disease. Yeah, I think that's really good just to set that realistic expectation. And then what about your approach to autism? Uh, Anyone that comes to you on the autism spectrum disorder, what does that look like? So I kind of break it down into four categories. I look at gut health. I then also look at detoxification um, impairments. I look at the mitochondria because about 60 to 80 percent of children with autism have some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction, not disease, but dysfunction. And um, I will also then look at the immune system as well. So I kind of break it up into those four categories and then see where a child fits in. Um, I think it's important to get a lot of as much information as possible um, as baseline, and then we know which direction to go in. But the majority of children with autism, a lot of work has to be done on the gut. Um, And that's usually where I start and then kind of weave in, okay, does mitochondria need to be supported? Um, Does the immune system need to be supported? Or uh, really, do we have to focus on detox? But what's interesting when talking about... um, tick-borne disease, I do see, I used to think autism was totally separate than tick-borne disease, but again, there's a huge overlap that's happening there. So it used to not be one of my top priorities to test for, but I've learned my lesson and it absolutely is one that I will test for very early on um, in the journey together with a family. What's the connection with detox? Yeah, detox, you know, there's a lot there. I, I focus a lot more on like the methylation pathway in particular, um, particularly the MTHFR mutation. And I do find that like in my practice, over 75% of children with autism have it. Can you explain that? For people? Yeah. So this stands for uh, methyl t- tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. And so essentially it's just the body's way of metabolizing folate. So folate we get from our green leafy vegetables, We then have to convert it in a way that the body can utilize, um, which is the bioactive form. But somebody who has this mutation, they can't convert to the bioactive form. So they're not able to detox as well because um, methyl tetrahydrofolate is involved in the glutathione pathway. And glutathione is the body's main detoxifier. It roams around the blood and it picks up on things that shouldn't be there. Allergens, toxins, viruses, bacteria binds to it and gets it out. But folate is also really important for um, RNA and DNA. It's important for protein synthesis. It's very involved. So that's just like a very basic marker I will look for. And I call it like a preventative vitamin. If you have it, um, you just take either folinic acid or methyl tetrahydrofolate, bypasses the pathway, and you improve detox. It's also important, not particularly that mutation, but folate in general, because with autism, there is a percentage of children that have folate uh, cerebral folate deficiency, meaning they can't get enough folate into their brain. And that's been associated with um, speech and communication. So if anyone has autism where their child does have some communication uh, challenges, this is one you definitely want to look for. And essentially, you just flood the system with folinic acid or methyl tetrahydrofolate, and uh, it helps with uh, speech and communication. Oh, that's awesome. What is your what's your perspective on like why children have autism? Oh, it's so complicated, so multifactorial. I think it's definitely not one thing. Um, I think it's a huge combination of a lot. So uh, is there a genetic? Especially like considering like just the increase, like 
Absolutely. I do not think that it's just because of the diagnostic criteria has changed. Absolutely not. Our kids are much sicker. Like even since starting in this work, um, which has been eight years, so really not that long, the kids are much sicker than they were in the beginning of my career. And so I do think there's a genetic predisposition, right? But just because you have a disposition doesn't mean that the it's going to manifest, right? It's the environmental triggers that cause that manifestation. And so I think there's just way too much of a burden on our children. Um, and that's from the food that we eat. That's from the toxins and the chemicals that they're exposed to. Um, I think just in general, we're less healthy, all of us. And I think infections are more rampant. The bugs are stronger. And uh, so I do think it's it's very it's it's multifactorial and um, it, it's complicated. Our kids yeah, aren't don't sure. just fit into one box. Yeah, yeah. And is there anything that you just really wish people knew about autism? I wish people understood that it's an autoimmune disease. And I know that people don't. That's not necessarily a popular opinion, but it really is. Like it's it's a the the immune system and the body. It's just so inflamed, right? So the they're level of inflammation is high. So anything that comes at it, it just increases that level of inflammation. And if we're really able to look at that and address that and get the underlying causes, there absolutely can be improvement in symptoms. And the whole thing is like, they're perfect as they are and they know everything that's going on. The thing is that I just want them to feel happier and more comfortable living in their own body. And like, there's so much that we can do for that. Yeah, that's such a good way to say it. And I hope that people listening to this find hope in that, you know, like that it can be such a frustrating place to be, especially if you don't know that there are options out there for improvement. So I really hope that people listening just get so much encouragement from that. I hope so, too. Yeah. OK. And then pans and pandas was the other category of thing that I was really hoping to get to. And so you're going to have to, I think, explain that, because I know for me, like I've my I would say my health journey has been about a decade in the making. But I really only heard about pans and pandas like in the last four years, maybe when some friends, you know, were telling me about it. And then I see about it a little bit here and a little bit there. And so I've slowly been learning. But I think that that one's probably the most unfamiliar Absolutely. So this is really my one of my biggest specialties, pans pandas, because for this exact reason, it's not um, as common or talked about or heard about. Um, and so people end up finding about it because they're persistent moms that are just looking online and trying to figure out what's going on with their children. But essentially, pans and pandas, what it stands for, pans, I'm going to talk about that first, stands for pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome. And this is more of like an umbrella term. The more common one that you hear about is PANDAS. And PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal Infections, okay? So associated with strep. PANS is different in the sense that it's not just strep that causes it, right? It could be many other things. It could be mycoplasma. It could be viruses. Um, it could be environmental triggers. It could be metabolic issues. So that's why it's an umbrella term. But this one, what's so interesting about this disease, I would say, is that it's an acute, abrupt onset of either significant OCD, uh, restrictive eating, um, and then followed with some other symptoms of like significant separation anxiety, tics, uh, regression in behaviors, like all of a sudden kids are talking and baby talk again. Um, there could be a decline in any type of like academic skills, in particular math and in particular um, English. Um, it's just, I can't stress enough the acute abrupt onset. Like there is, your child is different. You woke up different the next day. And like, that's how I know it's a, it's a pans or a pandas case. It's like the, when the parents are coming in and they're like, I'm making this date up, March 13th, 2022, my child completely changed. And it's like, OK, we got to dive deep and see what could have been the potential triggers that are causing this. And usually what we end up finding is that there's some sort of infectious trigger. But the kid doesn't necessarily present with the acute, uh, excuse me, the acute physical symptoms, meaning there was strep around them. Maybe like maybe their sibling had strep, but they weren't sick. 
but they weren't sick with the sense of the physical symptoms. So they didn't have the strep, you know, the sore throat, the lethargy, the stomach ache. Instead, a few weeks later, they were just a completely different child. And it's because it manifested in neurological symptoms of um, and psychiatric symptoms rather than it being physical. Um, so it's a complicated one, and it, but it really is more common than we think. About one in two, it's estimated that one in 200 children will have PANS or PANDAS. Um, and unfortunately, many of them will be not diagnosed appropriately and go down the psychiatric route and going on multiple psychiatric medications without much um, improvement because it's not a psychiatric disorder. You have to treat the infection and the inflammation. You can't just treat um, the OCD or the anxiety or the symptoms. You're not going to get as far with treatment. Yeah. So what should someone do if they suspect that? Like, what kind of how should they look for what should they look for in a provider or treatment options? You absolutely have to look for a pro- provider that understands pans and pandas and has worked with pro- worked with these children. Um, I really think it's important to work with a specialist because these the specialists know how to go about treatment um, and they won't miss it. And I'm going to tell you how I quickly got into pans and pandas is because there was besides working with my mentors, there was one child that came to my office very early in my career, had the classic signs. All of a sudden, he was separation anxiety through the roof, was starting to like sleep with the parents again. He started wetting the bed after being completely dry. So anyone whose child was completely dry and potty trained, and then all of a sudden they're starting to urinate again You in the bed, you have to rule out pans and pandas. Of course, you want to look for urinary tract infections and things like that. But Pans and pandas, you have to look for. But um, he's had peeling finger, like peeling skin on the fingers and the toes. And um, I, 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 miss, I missed it. I thought it was yeast. Um, and it, it didn't occur to me afterwards until months later when he was lost to follow up that it was pans, pandas, and I had missed that case. Um, so that's why I'm just saying, like, you can go to a functional medicine provider, somebody that even works in pediatric, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to give you or f- realize what the diagnosis is, right? So if you suspect it, you should really go to a provider and it's somebody that you can talk to to be able to give the full history because pans and pandas is a clinical diagnosis. There is no lab test that's going to rule it in and there's no lab test that's going to rule it out. So if you go to your doctor and you have elevated strep titers, that does not mean you have pandas. It is based on the history where it's an acute abrupt onset and somewhere in that history, we find that there was an exposure to some sort of infection, um, but that takes time to work through that case. So you need, um, so I guess I can't stress enough is like, just go to somebody who really understands it to get a proper diagnosis so you can get on the right path of treatment. Um, there has been, somebody looked into this, I forget who it was, but it showed that some people go up to like 12 different providers before they get the actual proper diagnosis. That's years, that's thousands of dollars worth of your time. Like that's putting your kid on medication that they might not need. It's just, it, just if you suspect it, really try to work with somebody that understands it. Yeah, that's really good advice. I feel like this whole episode is so good and just could be like the missing link for a lot of people that are have been sick for so long or have their kids struggling for so long and just don't know what to do. And so I wondered if you kind of shared one example in there, but do you have any other examples of like outcomes of like how much improvement are kids seeing after going through treatment for some of these things? Absolutely. That's a great question. So my goal is always to decrease the severity, the frequency and the duration of flares. And so what flares are and how pans and pandas can present is it's relapsing and remitting, meaning that when they're exposed to something, they can go into a flare for you know, weeks to months and things can be really difficult. And then all of a sudden things are better and they're back to normal, right? But it's relapsing and remitting. And so it can be very complicated and frustrating and traumatic for children and for their families. But the goal is always decrease severity, frequency, and duration of flares so that the children, like when they're in a flare, it's manageable. They can still go to school. They can still maintain friendships. They're you know, there's just a little bit of challenges rather than life stopping, life altering uh, challenges. So that's the goal. The one thing about pans and pandas is it resolves at two periods of time in life, either at puberty or at adulthood when the blood brain barrier closes. So for females, that's around 21 and males, that's around 24. I 
can't stress enough that even if you're on a very good track, meaning that there's very minimal flares and you still have to be on a prophylactic antimicrobial and a prophylactic anti-inflammatory until those two periods of time. It's usually the children that the onset is very early on that it resolves around puberty. The children that it occurs later on, um, they usually resolve around adulthood. But one thing I've noticed about my adults now after working with them is they are so resilient. Like I am blown away by them. Um, you know, when I talk to them, these are people that are now, in, you know, went through college and are in the workforce. And I just ask them, like, how do you, how do they do it all? Like how, because they're just not phased by certain things. They're not phased by, you know, getting a new job or going to a job interview or losing a job or breaking up with somebody. And it, it blows me away. And they're like, this is nothing compared to what I went through as a child. So all I have to say, and again, with hope is like, your kid is going to become so resilient. And if you like really support your family and yourself, you too, like as a, as a parent and the siblings will also be resilient, like as a family structure. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. So um, that always gives me a lot of hope. There's always light at the end of the tunnel and it will get better. That's the biggest thing. It's like, it will get better. It does get better. And it's not forever. Yeah. So good. What kind of improved outcomes have you seen with kids on the autism spectrum disorder? Oh, it's and that also ranges, but it's another beautiful place to be. Like the kids are, you know, I have kids that came that were not originally speaking and they start to talk and they go into mainstream classrooms. And these kids are so brilliant, like all of them, all of them, whether they can communicate or not, brilliant. Um and so sweet and so loving and something that's really opened a lot of um, my adult patients up recently is spell to communicate, um, which I, I'm not a practitioner of it. I, it's just a different way to communicate using more of the gross motor skills rather than fine motor skills. And I have adults like 30 year olds who um, <laughs> went and got GEDs are taking community classic college classes who are authors like published authors now these kids are so or kids they're adults they're they're amazing and like that's why i have to say like never give up like no matter what age they are never give up there's always hope you just have to find the right thing um and i think you know the ones who have been able to really be successful with spell to communicate the parents have done so much work you know up and up until then like that the kids could be open and took to the, the letter boards easily. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, there's so much room always, and um, you just have to find the right provider and the right therapy and um, for your child, but just never give up hope there either. Yeah, really awesome. Thank you for sharing all that. I'm so excited to hear like feedback from this episode because I know it's gonna be really encouraging. Um, three questions that I always ask every guest. And the first one is, what healthy living resource would you recommend? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I, I really do like the environmental working group. I'm sure some other people use that one too. But I really like if you're confused on what to what products to use in your household, um, I feel like it's just a great starting point. Um, and these little changes that you can make, so whether it's like cleaning supplies or it's like what food should you buy organic or it's okay not to buy organic. I just think these little things make such a big difference and it's such an easy resource to get your hands on. Um, so it's the one I usually yeah the best. Like household products and personal care products. Is that usually something that you also kind of guide your clients through? Absolutely. Because again, when we're just trying to take down the toxic burden, um, so we have to clean up the home. Yeah, Absolutely. What's your favorite healthy snack? I really like carrots with a guacamole, like to dip in guacamole. That um, I love guacamole in general. I just think it's like filling. There's so much healthy fat in it. It just really um, gets me through the day. And I just think it's a wonderful, delicious, healthy snack. Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'd have that snack with you any day. <laughs> And who would you love to see as a guest on the Daily Wellness Podcast? Oh, my goodness. That is a another great question. 
Oh, if people are interested in um, Pans Pandas, Dr. Sue Sweeto, she's like the grandmother of Pans Pandas. She was the one that discovered it and wrote about it. And um, she's just amazing. And I just, there are certain people you, I, you just thank God for, and she's one of them in the sense of like, thank God she found this. And like, because of her, all these families can be helped and have answers. So, and she's really fought for this diagnosis because it's often not um, validated in a lot of uh, mainstream traditional pediatrician's office, infectious disease doctors, and she's really fought for these families. So I, I, I look up to her. I love her. So, and she's wonderful. Yeah. I think that'd be an interesting conversation. Thanks for the recommendation. Yes. yes. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for all this valuable information. I'm just loving it. I think this is having a kid that has gone through Lyme disease and realizing like the chronic effects that that could have had for him long term and being so grateful for the treatment that he received. I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing for families and for kids. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Before you go, I wanted to let you know that I created a new resource for you. It's a free download that teaches you how to shop for non-toxic cookware. This guide spills the beans on what you don't want and what to look for instead to help make sure that you're not getting harmful chemicals in your food through your cookware. You can get it via the link on my website or right here in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode on the Daily Wellness Podcast. We hope that you found it helpful for your own wellness journey. And if so, we'd love for you to leave a review. Then come back and listen for review shout outs on upcoming episodes. For more information, check out the show notes and connect with us on our website, dailywellnesscommunity.com. 